Reflections of a Russian Statesman by Konstantin Petrovich Pobyedyonostsev. Chapter 1. Church and State. The conflict between religious and political principles is one of the most remarkable phenomena of our time. When discord once appears in the sphere of religious and spiritual principles, it is impossible to predict by what limits it will be confined, what elements it will involve, and whither will flow the stream of passions aroused by the clash of convictions and beliefs. Where the religious convictions of a people are concerned, it is essential that the state shall establish its demands and regulations with a special caution to avoid such collisions with their sentiments and spiritual necessities as would be resented by the masses. For, however powerful the state may be, its power is based alone upon the identity and religious profession with the people. The faith of the people sustains it. When discord once appears to weaken this identity, its foundations are sapped, its power dissolves away. In spiritual sympathy with its rulers, a people may bear many heavy burdens, may concede much, and surrender many of its privileges and rights. In one domain alone, the state must not demand concession, or the people concede, and that is the domain where every believer, and all together, sink the foundations of their spiritual existence and bind themselves with eternity. There are depths in this domain to which the secular power dare not and must not descend, lest it strike at the roots of faith in each and all. The prime cause of the misunderstandings which now exist, and which threaten to increase, between the people and its rulers is the artificial theory, popularly held, of the relations of church and state. In the course of events in Western Europe, events indissolubly bound up with the development of the Roman Catholic Church, there originated and took root, as an element in political construction, the idea of the church as a religious and political institution, with a power which, in opposition to the state, carried on with it a political conflict, the incidents of which crowd the pages of history in Western Europe. This conception of the political mission of the church has driven into the background its simple, true, and natural conception as a congregation of Christians organically bound by identity of faith in divine alliance. Yet this innate conception lies concealed in the depths of the popular conscience, corresponding with the essential aspiration of the human soul, the aspiration to faith and identity of faith with others. In this sense, the church, as a community of believers, cannot and must not detach itself from the state, as a society united by a civil bond. Whatever perfection theories based on the separation of church and state may attain in the minds of logicians, they do not satisfy the simple sentiments of the mass of believers. They may indeed content the political mind, which sees in them the best of all possible compromises, and a perfect construction of philosophic ideas, but in the depths of the soul which feels the living necessity of faith and of unity of faith with life, these artificial theories are irreconcilable with truth. The spiritual life needs to seek above all things spiritual unity. To this it aspires as the ideal of its existence, but when this ideal is realized in duality, it scorns to accept it and turns away. By its nature, faith is uncompromising and tolerates no accommodations in its ideals. It is true that the actual life of all and each of us is an uninterrupted history of failure and duality, a melancholy discord between thought and work, between faith and life. But in this ceaseless struggle, the human soul is sustained by nothing so much as by faith in an ideal ultimate unity, a faith which it cherishes as a strongest sanctuary of existence. Reduce a believer to the recognition of this duality, he will be humiliated. Reveal to him that end of all duality to which his soul aspires, he lifts his head, he feels his life renewed and marches onward armed with faith. Tell him that life and faith are independent of one another, 
and his soul rejects the thought with the abhorrence with which it would reject the thought of ultimate annihilation. It may be objected that this is a question of personal belief, but the faith of individuals can in no way be distinguished from the faith of the church, for its essential need is community, and of this need it finds satisfaction only in the church. The struggle between church and state in Western Europe has now endured for many years. The last word in this struggle has not yet been spoken, and what that word will be is still unknown. Each party still measures its strength and assembles its forces around it. The state relies upon the forces of intelligence. The church relies upon the faith of the people and upon the recognition of its spiritual authority. There can be no doubt that in the end the victory will belong to that party which displays the most perfect unity in a living and spiritual faith. The intelligence of the partisans of the state is in any case confronted with a delicate task, the task of alluring to its side and binding with it in firm alliance the popular faith. But to gain the sympathy and alliance of faith, intelligence alone is vain. The state must show in itself a living faith. Si vis mi flere dolendum est primum ipsi tibi. If you want me to cry, you must first feel sorry for yourself. The popular mind is suspicious and may not be seduced by appearances of faith or drawn by compromise, for the living faith accepts no compromise and rejects the authority of rational logic. Though faith is vulgarly considered as identical with conviction, the conviction of reason must not be confounded with the conviction of faith, and the forces of intellect are sadly mistaken if they assume in themselves the necessary elements of spiritual force, independently of faith, which is their very essence. This confusion of ideas is a great danger to the state in its struggle with the church, when at the time of the Reformation in Germany, the state set itself at the head of the movement against the old ecclesiastical power and built a new organization for the church, it possessed actually the spiritual force of faith. The movement which it led had its origin among the people. It was animated by the deepest and strongest faith. Its first leaders represented the highest intelligence of the community and glowed with the fire of a sincere faith uniting them with the people. Thus, in this movement were concentrated immense spiritual forces, which, after many years of struggle, compelled the surrender of the ancient faith. Today, conditions differ altogether. From the side of the state, discord has arisen between the religion of the people and the political organization of the church. From the other quarter of intelligence has sprung a still more striking disunion between religion and its scientific construction. Theological science, no longer restricted to its original function of studying and comprehending religious belief, threatens to absorb all belief by submitting it as a phenomenon and external object of investigation to the unsparing critical analysis of reason. Political science has established a carefully elaborated doctrine of the definite severance of church from state, in consequence of which, by the operation of a law admitting no division of supreme power, the church inevitably appears as an institution subordinate to the state. Together with this, the state appears, according to the new conception, as an institution detached from every religion and indifferent to all. It is natural that, from this point of view, the church appears merely as an institution satisfying one of the needs of the population recognized by the state, namely, the need of religion. And the modern state, while exercising over this institution control and supervision, in no way troubles about religion itself. For the state, as a supreme political institution, such a theory is attractive. It assumes it complete autonomy and elimination of opposition, and the simplification of all the operations of its ecclesiastical policy. But such assurances are delusive. For this theory, evolved in the studies of ministers and scholars, the conscience of the people will not accept. In all that relates to religion, the masses demand simplicity and completeness which satisfy their minds, and they reject all artificial ideas, instinctively discerning their diversity from truth. 
political theorists will accept the retention of their offices by priests and professors who, as unhappily often occurs in Germany, publicly declare their disbelief in the divinity of our Savior. The conscience of the people will never accept such an interpretation of the priestly office, but will reject it with abhorrence as a falsehood. Unhappy and hopeless is the position of the ruling power when in its disposition in matters of religion, the masses everywhere detect falsehood and infidelity. 2. The separation of church and state was treated remarkably by the ex-priest Hyacinta in his public lectures delivered in Geneva in the spring of 1863, War to the Knife with the Church. This is the fancy of the Revolutionary Party, or at least of its extreme representatives, who in politics call themselves Jacobins, and in the domain of religious ideas propagate materialism and infidelity. These men are armed with two weapons, sophistry and violence. They have long lost the confidence of men. They are blind. They lack the strength to continue the struggle because they confound all among their adversaries, distinguish nothing, and exaggerate beyond measure their importance. The aim of the French Revolution was to regenerate society, but regeneration could only succeed through the application to civil society of Christian principles. A struggle began between the revolution and the Roman theocracy, for the revolution confounded this theocracy with the Catholic Church, the universe which surrounds all believing Christians, the evangel itself, and the person of Christ. Thus, war was declared not only with Rome, but with the kingdom of Christ on earth. In the heart of Christendom, these men began to persecute the very religious feeling which, for nigh 2,000 years, had been inseparably associated with Christianity. Such was the adversary they challenged to battle, arming themselves with two weapons, base and dishonorable both, the axe of the headsman and the living word of the sophist. Thanks to the abbe free thinkers who thronged the court, thanks to the admitted levity of contemporary morals, Catholicism in France was in an evil state. Suddenly, it was summoned, awakened, and dragged to prison. In his name ascended the scaffold priests, young girls and peasants, side by side with distinguished nobles, with poets, and with statesmen, as in the epoch of the early Caesars. Till then, its robes had been stained by the blood of St. Bartholomew's night, and traces of parents' and orphans' tears caused by the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. Yet all these traces were suddenly effaced. Nothing was seen save the blood from its own veins, the traces of its own tears. From this the church soon arose again to a great and stainless glory. For this glory her executioners had prepared her. Thus acted the sophist philosophers also. They opened questions which modern science declares insoluble. They unveiled the secrets of death, seeing in it only fantasy and delusion. They strove to pierce to the origin of humanity, and instead of the atom of our Bibles, called to its cradle some unknown being slowly developed from animal life, an ape at first, and then a man. Having placed this man both to his origin and as to his end in an animal medium, having degraded him to the limits of corruption, they changed their tone and began to glorify his greatness. How great art thou, man, they cried. How great art thou in thy atheism and in thy materialism and in thy freedom, submitting to nothing in morals. But in the glory of his strange greatness, man seemed crushed with grief. He had forsaken God, but he kept the need of religion. So imperious is this need that religion may exist even without God, such as Buddhism, a religion numbering in its millions of adherents. But what if it were true that man first sprang from an animal matter? This in no way changes the case of faith. In the book of Genesis, man was made from a material baser still, mud and dust, a handful of earth. It is not the envelope that makes the man. He took from his creator a living soul, a breath of religious and moral life, of which, whatever he may wish, he cannot be rid. And this forbids him ever to cut himself loose from the Christian religion. The church must be separated from the state, we are told. 
These are only words expressing no distinct idea, for the word separation may express many things. We must first understand in what the separation consists. If it consists in the clearer delimitation of religious and secular society, a sincere and permanent delimitation effected without craft or violence, all men will approve of such separation. If, from a practical standpoint, it is demanded that the state shall abdicate its right of appointing the ministers of the church and shall repudiate its responsibility for their maintenance, the concession of this demand would establish a most desirable and ideal state of affairs, for which it is necessary to prepare under favorable circumstances and in legal form. When this question matures, the state, if it wishes so to decide it, is bound to restore to the proper parties the right to elect priests and bishops. In such case, it will be impossible to surrender to the Pope that which belongs to the clergy and to the people by historical and apostolic right. The state is merely depository of this right, which in no way belongs to it. We are told that this separation is to be understood in the widest sense. Able and learned men define it thus. The state has no concern with the church or the church with the state. Thus, humanity is to revolve in two great circles. In one circle will be the body, in the other the soul. And between these circles will be a void as between heaven and earth. But this is impossible. The body cannot separate itself from its soul. Soul and body live a single life. Can we expect that the church, I do not speak of the Catholic church in particular, but of the universal church, will consent to abdicate its interest in civil society, in family society, human society, all, in short, that is understood by the state? Since when has it been supposed that the function of the church is to train ascetics to people monasteries, to display in temples the poetry of its ceremonies and processions? No, these are but a little part of the duties entrusted to the church. To it was appointed another mission, to teach all peoples. That is its work. Its duty is to train the peoples of the earth, that from the midst of the earthly city and earthly family, they may be not altogether unworthy to step into the heavenly city and the heavenly communion. At birth, at marriage, at death, in the supreme moments of human existence, the church appears with its three solemn sacraments. And yet we are told that the church has no concern with family life. Its duty is to inspire the people with respect for the law and for power, and to inspire in power respect for human freedom. Yet we are told that the church has no concern with society. No, the moral principle is indivisible. It cannot be apportioned to provide one system of morals for individuals, another for society, one for the body, another for the soul. In a single moral principle are embraced all the relations of life personal, domestic, and political, and no church which retains the consciousness of its own worthiness will ever surrender its lawful influence on the family or on civil society to demand that the church shall abstain from intervention in civil affairs is scarcely to give it new strength. The state, we are told, has no concern with the church. Civil society was first established on the basis of the primitive family, every head of a family being a citizen. In that age, the society of believers was indistinguishable from the family or from the entire people. In the course of time, the structure of civil society was perfected and a universal Christianity arose, embracing both families and people. How can we justly say to the father and the citizen, you and the church are independent of one another? Unhappily, both father and citizen have long ago said this to themselves. The father has grown indifferent to the tendencies and sentiments of religion in his family circle. He can find no answer when his wife turns to him with her doubts, when his child, with childish simplicity, asks, Who is this God? And why dost thou not pray to him? And what is this death that comes and bears children away? If the father answers nothing to these questions, what answer will the child devise? And if the father finds an answer, the child hears in it a fable and not the voice of the living faith. 
The consequence is that children become skeptical as their fathers, or superstitious as their mothers and their confessors. Thus operates the separation of the church and state in the family circle. In the place of the father is introduced into the house a strange priest, in the capacity of a spiritual guide, and the guardian of consciences, under aspect of a teacher. For this the priests without doubt are to be blamed, but still more guilty are the parents for permitting the priest to take their places at the domestic hearth. With these conditions, the citizen and the civil power must not be surprised if the edifice they have erected tumbles and crushes them with its ruins. Such is the consequence of the separation of church and state. Part 3 when, early in the 40s, the king of Prussia learned that some of the citizens of Berlin had forsaken the Christian church, he expressed surprise and asked with a smile, what church, then, they were about to join? In the west of Europe, this question would be meaningless nowadays. Half a century ago, it was believed that he who abandoned Christianity had left the firm ground to live suspended in space. But, nowadays... To be without religion is a symptom of steadfastness, not of levity. In the Middle Ages, an unbeliever was regarded as a madman, a madman at the same time so repulsive and dangerous that he was delivered to the stake. At that time, there was no place for unbelieving citizens, but there were believers deprived of the right of citizenship, vagabonds and outlaws to whom the state refused the protection of the law, and who sought the protection of their feudal lords, those mighty vassals who repudiated the authority of the state, might even enter upon conflict with their suzerains. In our time, a subject who declared himself independent of the state, who refused to pay taxes, to render military service, or to recognize authority, in short, to be his own government, would, as unbelievers in the Middle Ages, be declared insane. But, instead of being burnt at the stake, would either be forced to submit to the lawful authorities or be expelled his country. He might be transported to other territories, where also he would be reduced to submission or expelled. At the present day, we may freely reject religion and the state, but we must not deny the state. The state guarantees the enjoyment of social life in all its plentitude, while the church no longer rules over social life as it ruled before. Our time is distinguished by an attempt to subject all human relations to the power of the state. If the church were to pretend to dominion over even half of them, it would meet from all sides with obstacles and opposition. Notwithstanding the liberty everywhere extolled, we tend in all things to fall under the power of the state. We establish laws and regulations for every important condition of our social life. Many formally demand complete centralization and the assimilation of individual conditions by legislative measures. If but a shoe pinches, we demand regulation by the state. If half a dozen individuals complain of a burden, they must seek redress in a petition to the government. In former times, they would have sought redress in the church. The doctrine that all individual life must be absorbed in the life of the community and that the life of the community must be concentrated in the state and regulated by it, is the chief motive of the socialist ideal. And as this doctrine in a distinct or indistinct form has taken root in the strongest minds, the simplest man is often unconsciously in sympathy with the socialist. It is impossible to ignore that a change has taken place in the relationship of the church to the community of believers which sustains it. The people will no longer admit the re-establishment of the old relationship of the church with its flock, with its interference in individual and domestic life, in the life of the community, in politics, and in the economy of society. The state establishes law after law. The church not only no longer promulgates no new dogmas, but cannot, as before, insist formally and rigorously upon the interpretation and application of its teachings. In appearance, therefore, the church has lost all authority, as contrasted with the disproportionate powers usurped by the state. In reality, however, this is not so, for the church relies on the spiritual forces of the people. Part 4. 
The oldest and most familiar system of relationship of church to state is the system of established or state churches. Out of the multitude of religions, the state adopts and recognizes as the true faith one which it maintains and protects exclusively to the prejudice of all remaining churches and religions. This prejudice in general means that the remaining churches are not recognized as true or entirely true, but practically it is expressed in many forms with innumerable shadows from non-recognition and alienation to persecution. In all cases where the system is in force, the estranged faiths submit more or less diminution in honor and prerogative as compared with the established faith. The state must not be the representative of the material interests of society alone. Were it so, it would deprive itself of religious forces and would abandon its spiritual community with the people. The stronger will the state be, the more important in the eyes of the masses, the more firmly it stands as their spiritual representative. Under these conditions alone, will the sentiment of respect for the law and of confidence in the power of the state be maintained and strengthened among the people. No considerations for the safety of the state, for its prosperity and advantage, no moral principle even, is itself sufficient to strengthen the bonds between the people and its rulers. For the moral principle is never steadfast, and it loses its fundamental base when it is bereft of the sanction of a religion. This force of cohesion will, without doubt, be lost to that state which, in the name of impartial relationship of every religious belief, cuts itself loose from all. The confidence of the people and its rulers is founded on faith, that is, not only on identity of religious profession, but on the simple conviction that its rulers have faith themselves and rule according to it. Even the heathen and Mohammedan peoples have more confidence and respect for a government which stands on the firm principles of faith, whatever the faith may be, than for a government which acknowledges no faith and is indifferent to all. Such is the indisputable superiority of the established church. Nevertheless, in the course of centuries, the circumstances in which this system established itself have changed and new conditions have arisen which combine to make its operation more difficult than before. When the first foundations of European civilization and politics were laid, the Christian state was strong by its whole and indissoluble alliance with the United Christian Church. Since then, the Christian Church has broken up into innumerable sects and religions, each of which pretends to be the only true doctrine and the only true church. By such means, the state was confronted with many different doctrines which divided the support of the people. With the destruction of universal communion in a single faith, the time must come when the dominant church supported by the state becomes a church of an insignificant minority and loses sympathy with, or is deprived of the sympathy of, the mass of the people. When this condition has once been realized, Grave troubles inevitably rise in the definition of the relationship of the state and its established church to the churches to which the majority of the people belongs. Part 5. At the end of the 18th century, there began in Western Europe a change from the ancient system to the system of equalization of Christian beliefs before the state, with the exception, however, from this equality of sectarians and Jews. The state accepted Christianity as the essential basis of its being and of social order, and adherence to one or another of the churches or religions became obligatory for every citizen. Since 1848, this relation of the state and church has essentially changed. The rising waves of liberalism have overthrown the ancient rampart and threatened to undermine the foundations of the Christian state. The separation of church and state is advocated everywhere, the state has no concern with the church. All men are free to believe what they will, or to not believe at all. The fundamental principles promulgated by the Frankfurt Parliament in 1848-49 to are the embodiment of this doctrine, and, although they soon ceased to be operative legislation, served and serve today as the ideal for the establishment of liberal principles in the legislation of Western Europe in modern times. Political and civil rights no longer depend upon religion, or even upon adherence to one or another of the churches or sects. 
Concerning religion, the state asks no questions. The solemnization of marriage and other acts of the civil condition no longer appertain to the church. The full freedom of mixed marriage is proclaimed, and the religious principle of the indissolubility of marriage is destroyed by facility of divorce, removed from the jurisdiction of the ecclesiastical courts. In view of all these charges, which in France have gone so far as the official renunciation of faith, and even so far as violence against the church, we may well ask, can the modern state be called a Christian state? But here we observe the inconsistency which we have noticed in individuals who, having severed their organic alliance with the Christian church, at the same time lead a life in accordance with its principles. The modern state, while severing its organic alliance with the Christian church, cannot dispense with the forms and ceremonies which it practices. The churches and their ministers are maintained out of the treasury of the state. The army and all public institutions are provided with spiritual directors. The Christian festivals are civil holidays. In the public service, in the courts of justice, the oath retains its obligatory force. In Germany, there is no state church. Nevertheless, the supremacy, Kirchenhoheit, in the evangelical church appertains to the chief of the state. In parliament and in all social affairs, the government may not ignore the parties with their different religious professions. In England, with its absolute equality of all religions on liberal principles, not only the sovereign, but the greatest dignitaries of state must belong to the Anglican church. In the United States, also, perfect religious equality obtains. To all churches, to all religious communities, the relations of the state are identical with its relations to private corporations. In the state schools, the study of the law of God and the obligatory reading of the scriptures are forbidden. Yet Congress opens its sessions with prayer, with the participation of an ecclesiastic. The state maintains ministers of religion in the army and on the fleet. From time to time, the president appoints days of thanksgiving and repentance, a stern law upholds the sanctity of the Sabbath. In certain states, the severest punishments are ordained for swearing and blasphemy. Does it not follow, then, that the atheist state is no more than an impossible utopia, infidelity being negation of the state? Religion and, above all, Christianity is the source of every right in political and civil life and of all true culture. It is for this reason, then, that those political parties, the most inimical to social order, parties radically denying the state, are the first to declare that religion is a personal thing in which private and individual interests alone are concerned. Part 6. The system of a free church in a free state is founded on abstract principles and hypotheses. It embodies not the principle of belief, but the principle of religious indifferentism, and it is associated with doctrines which inculcate not tolerance and respect, but a manifest or tacit contempt for religion as an outworn factor of the physical development of individual and national life. In the abstract conception of this system, which is the product of the latest nationalism, the church appears as a political institution of abstract construction with a definite aim, or as a private corporation established likewise with a definite aim, as other corporations recognized by the state. The conception of this aim is abstract also, for on it are reflected the diverse shades associated with one or the other conception of religion, from abstract respect for religion, as the highest element of physical life, to fanatical contempt for it as the basest factor and as an element of danger and disintegration. Thus, in the construction of the system, we see at the first glance the ambiguity and indistinctness of its fundamental principles and propositions. What the consequence of this system in practice will be must be proved by the experience of ages and generations. Hitherto, our experience has been insignificant compared with the experience of the many centuries through which the ancient system acted and acts. But it is easy to foresee that the new system cannot be durable, for it does not correspond with the essential needs and conditions of human nature. However logically we may affirm the proposition 
that all churches and all religions are equal and all the same, this proposition will not be admitted unreservedly by a single man who preserves religion in his soul and feels the need of it. Such a man will answer, yes, all faiths are equal, but for me, mine is best. Were the state to establish today the severest and most precise equalization of all churches and religions before the law, tomorrow signs would appear that the relative powers of the various religions were no longer equal. In 30 or 50 years from the time of legal equalization, we should find that one enjoyed a preponderating influence, dominated minds, and determined judgments, and this, either because it approximated more closely to canonical truth, or because its doctrine and ritual corresponded better to the character of the people, or because its organization and discipline were more perfect and increased its opportunities for systemic activity, or because it counted more devoted adherents and workers. Of this, there are many instances. In Ireland, British legislation has established equality of the rival churches, but it does not, therefore, result that all churches are equal. In reality, the Roman Catholic Church, at the moment of its legal enfranchisement, received full power to extend and consolidate throughout the country its predominant influence not only on individual minds, but on all the political institutions of the country, on the courts of justice, the administration, and the schools. The Constitution of the United States requires the non-interference of the state in religion. The consequence is that the Roman Catholic is rapidly becoming the dominant church in America. In North America, it enjoys a greater liberty of action than in any other European state, restricted by no relation to the state, submitting to no control. The Pope distributes dioceses, appoints bishops, founds spiritual orders, and converts in vast numbers, and weaves over the whole territory a close network of ecclesiastical agents and institutions. The papacy controls the great mass of Catholics, yearly increasing with the arrival of fresh immigrants, and counts already as its own a fourth of the total population, while the remaining three quarters is divided into a multitude of sects. Taking advantage of all opportunities to evade the law, the Catholic Church has increased its power to immense proportions. The administration of whole states is in its hand or under its influence. In many large towns, the municipal government depends exclusively from the Catholics. The Catholic Church disposes of millions of votes in a country where from numbers alone depends the whole administration of domestic and foreign affairs. From the height of the principle of religious equality, the state regards its dominion with indifference, but the future will show how long this favorite theory will obtain in the United States. Meanwhile, its defenders ask what concern has the state with inequalities which arise not by virtue of privilege or legal limitations, but in consequence of the internal strength or internal weakness of private corporations. The law cannot prevent such inequality. By this is an evasion of the question, or a solution only in theory. On paper, any absurdity may be justified and raised to the dignity of a harmonious system. On paper, it is easy to establish a clear boundary between the domain of politics and the domain of religion and morals. In reality, it is not so. Men must not be regarded as intelligent machines to be disposed as the general disposes his troops when he forms a line of battle. Every man embodies a world of moral and spiritual life, from which proceed the impulses which determine his activity in all the spheres of life. But the chief, the central impulse, springs from faith and from the conviction of truth the theorist only, reasoning independently of actuality, or ignoring it, will be satisfied by the ironical question, what is truth? In the souls of men, this question lives as the gravest question of life, a question requiring not a negative, but a positive answer. Thus the free state may decree that the free church concerns it not, but the free church, if it be truly founded on faith, will not accept this proposition, and will not endure indifferent relations to the free state. The church cannot abdicate its influence on civil and social life, and the greater its activity, the stronger its consciousness of internal working forces, the less it is possible 
for it to tolerate indifferent relations to the state, nor can such relations be tolerated if the church is not to abjure its duties and abandon its divine mission. On the church lies the duty of teaching and direction. To the church pertains the administration of the sacraments and the performance of ceremonies associated with the gravest acts of civil life. In this activity, the church of necessity is brought into constant contact with public and civil life. Of this, marriage and education are sufficient instances. Thus, as the state denying the church assumes control exclusively of the civil part of such affairs and renounces all authority in the spiritual religious part, the church assumes the functions surrendered by the state and, in separation from it, takes positions little by little, but fully and exclusively, of those moral and religious influences which constitute for the state an indispensable element of strength. The state remains master alone of material and, it may be, of intellectual forces, but one and the other are vain when unsupported by the forces of faith. Little by little, therefore, instead of the imagined equality of influence of the state and church in a political alliance, inequality and antagonism appear. The position, in any case, is an abnormal one, which must lead either to the predominance of the church over the apparently dominant state, or to revolution. Such are the hidden dangers of the system, so lauded by liberal theorists, of severance of church and state. The system of state or established churches has many defects, many inconveniences, and many difficulties. It does not preclude the possibility of antagonism or conflict, but it is absurd to suppose that it has outlived its time and that the formula of Cavour is the only key to the solution of all the difficulties of the most difficult of questions. The formula of Cavour is the fruit of that political doctrinarism which regards all questions of faith merely as political questions of the equalization of rights. It lacks spiritual insight, as lacked it another famous political formula, liberty, equality, and fraternity, which to the present day weighs upon superficial minds with a fatal burden. In both cases, the passionate apostles of freedom mistake in assuming freedom in equality. Bitter experience has proven a hundred times that freedom does not depend from equality and that equality is in no wise freedom. It is equally absurd to believe that the equalization of churches and religions before the state must result in freedom of belief. The history of modern times demonstrates that freedom and equality are not identical and that freedom in no way depends from equality. This has been Mr. Patriarch. Please join us next time for Chapter 2, The New Democracy, of Konstantin Pubia Dionotsev's Reflections of a Russian Statesman. Support of the channel is very much greatly appreciated. Links to do so to Subscribestar and PayPal can be found below. I'll see you next time.